absolutely fantastic. Good morning, everybody. Man, they did good at worship today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing up in this place today. Um, I just look at that whole group and just thinking, wow, we got white people with rhythm and, and some soul to them. It's kind of cool, you know what I mean? Um, I'm just kidding. If you're a first-time guest, I'm Pastor Mike, and I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Um, just want to let you know, if you didn't get a guide, we have them. Ushers are here. If you'll raise your hand, they'll be happy to bring it to you. And uh, inside of here, there are several things you're going to want. One is the sermon notes. Uh, we try to do notes every week. And a couple key things I'd like to tell you about notes. Uh, on the notes, if you turn it over on the back of it, at the bottom, there's something called Right Now Media. It's a resource that we have. It's all kinds of different videos you can watch. And every week, I put a follow-up video or teaching to whatever I'm teaching about. So it gives you something to study during the week based on the same topic. And then at the bottom is small group questions. Questions you can ask yourself as a follow-up, but also if you uh, are thinking about leading a small group, we're going to have small groups coming up in September. So we're looking for those who would say, yeah, I'll host a small group. And it can be as simple as honestly, just everybody bringing their sermon notes and going through this together uh, to host a small group. So just think about that. I'm very, very excited to tell you about a small group that has just developed literally this morning. Got the final yes. And it is, we're going to do a Monday marriage night. If you're a married person, uh, pay attention to me for just a, song, a moment. About to make the women really happy and the men kind of nervous. Are you ready? Because what we're going to be doing on Monday nights coming up for a small group is we're looking for a venue right now. We have professional ballroom teachers, dance teachers, that are going to do teaching for about 20, 30 minutes at the first of class. And then Pastor Doug is going to teach us on marriage as a follow up to it. So I'm letting you know now, ladies gives you a chance to work on him. Guys, it gives you a chance to come up with your excuses, okay? <laughs> Helping you out early, no, but in all seriousness, listen, guys push into this. Uh, man, let me just say, you want a romance? I'm just telling you right now, okay? Just push into this and dance a little bit, but that is one of the small groups that's coming up, so uh, be looking at those on our website. Also inside of here, we have our connect card, so if you want to connect with us in some way, first time guests, we would love to know that you're here. No hassle guarantee, nobody showing up at your house or anything like that, but we would like to have some information to communicate with you on here. Now, if you make a decision today to follow Jesus, recommit your life, you need to sign up for something, you can do that. And then on the back is prayer requests. Every Tuesday morning, prayer team prays. And then there's a giving envelope for those that ask, because we don't pass buckets or plates. There's boxes in the back of the room. Our people put their tithes and offerings in on their way out. But if it's your first time, I just want you to know that. Please don't feel compelled to give. We just like to communicate that with you. A couple of things that are coming up. I'm really excited uh, about everything that's going on. Of course, today we continue our summer game nights. And tonight is slip and slide kickball, everybody. <laughs> slip and slide kickball tonight, 5 o'clock. Um, if you would like to come and play, come and play. If you would like to have laughter, bring your lawn chair and just plop down and come check it out, right? There's a bunch of silly people running around slip and slides trying to run around the bases. We're going to be out of Pear Park at 5 o'clock. What time? 5 o'clock. out of Pear Park. We'll be playing a slip and slide kickball. Come out and join us today. Also, uh, next week, uh, the 16th at 8 a.m., at 8 a.m., we have an opportunity to serve the school again. But here's what I love about it. I was thinking about this. You know, churches all the time do uh, campus beautification days, right? Like people will get together and mow the lawn and landscape, weed, clean up, paint, whatever kind of a deal. And I love it because whenever we do that, it's a twofer because we're cleaning up our campus, but we're cleaning up our school at the same time. Yeah. But this week, this time, it's going to be focused in a specific area. Our athletic director, Spencer Hay, came to us. Uh, Tyler Brandyberg, which is our current school board um, member that's over Leesburg High School, we all got together with several other community partners. It's not just a, lake, a Church of the Lakes thing. It's a bunch of different uh, Red Apples Media, Lakefront TV, uh, a bunch of different people are involved with us. But we're going to have a day where we spruce up some of the athletic Fields. So we're going to work on the stadium. We're, uh, we're, we're looking for bucket trucks that we can maybe paint the goalposts to repaint those to look nice. We're going to work in the gym, taking down all the banners. They're getting all new matching banners to go up to make it look good. So it's a whole work day that we'll be working on there, but it's a community effort. So if you can come and be with us on that day, please get online, sign up, let us know that you are coming. Very, very excited about that. And then we have a first. So in, in, in five years, something we have never, ever done is, is something called VBS. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. What's it stand for? VBS? No, it doesn't. No. Vintage Bible School is what we're doing. 
Okay, here's the deal. You ready? I love this. It's an idea of our youth director. Our teenagers are going to be the teachers, and we are doing Bible school for you, seniors. It's vintage Bible school. Seniors sign up, 55 plus. You sign up, and you're going to come. We're going to have snacks for you. We're going to have arts and crafts. We're going to have teaching, all this kind of stuff. But listen to me. It is our teenagers that have the opportunity to serve you and do vintage Bible school. So please, can I encourage you? Come and, come and be a part. I was, we put out a video this week, and one of the things I said to the seniors is, you guys don't understand how much of an opportunity this is for our kids to take a leadership role. Because you show up and are in their group, they get to lead, they get to teach, they get to go through all of that stuff. What are we doing? We're just teaching them to be small group leaders and Sunday school teachers and all in the future, right? So part of you coming and participating seniors is also you're serving that generation. It should be a great, great opportunity. So that's going to be July 25th through 27th. Get online, sign up so we know how many snacks to buy. Come on, y'all. We're going to need to have enough Cheez-Its and, and, and another wafer. So um, please sign up for us. July 31st is a fifth Sunday family worship. Whenever we have five Sundays, right, we all worship together. Child dedication, baptism, and it is our fifth anniversary. Five years as a church, uh, so we're really excited about that. We're going to have a big dinner together in the cafeteria, but we do have, and we need, need to know how many are coming. So we need you to register for the fifth anniversary so we know about food. And then there's an opportunity in a couple of different categories to bring a salad or to bring something like that. So get online, please read through that as well. And then of course, I've already talked about 21 days of prayer and fasting coming up in August. And for those of us who are at that age, and I'm there, Lord Jesus, um, if you need to talk to your doctor before you do any type of fasting, I wanna encourage you to do that now, I'm giving you a little bit of window uh, to talk to your doctor. But I do wanna encourage, listen to me, I really, I meant what I said earlier, I want everybody to push in. Um, I think God will get serious when we get serious. Do you understand what I mean? Like when the, when the scripture says he looks to and fro for a people, right? I just, I get this picture of what would it look like in August if so many of us were pushing in and we were praying and we were fasting and we we're seeking the face of God. And yes, I'll be doing 5 a.m. prayer again live to get up at 5 a.m. online and do prayer with us or you can do it later in the day. But man, I just get this picture. I want us to do August in such a way, 21 days in such a way, that he looks to and fro and then he goes, ooh, Leesburg. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's going to be us. It's, it's going to be the obedience of each one of us and our participation in that. So plug in with that. All right. We are moving on in our series. Started a brand new series last week. We're doing a book study right now of the book of Philippians. So last week we did chapter one of the book of Philippians and started this whole, if you remember this book, uh, written by Paul in prison, right? A, 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 the irony of the book, of course, is that it's a guy writing from prison, but he's writing about joy, right? He's, he's, he's writing about, and so last week we said a few things like this. Happiness is external, right? Many of us are chasing happiness. We're chasing uh, everybody, ah, TGIF. What is that? Think that through for a second. What, what is that? That just means, you know, I'm just waiting for happy moments. I'm just chasing. Happy. I don't find happiness in what I do. I don't find purpose in what I do. I'm not looking at meaning in Monday. How about making it a meaningful Monday? Somebody? Like our, our, our uh, trainer, Al, he always says if you hate Mondays, you hate one-seventh of your life. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Right? But listen to me. Happiness is not external. I mean, happiness is external. I'm sorry. Joy is internal. What the scripture talks about is us finding joy in the Lord. Joy is something that cannot be knocked down. Joy is something that happens regardless of what's going on around us. Joy is something that carries us through the junk. Right? Happiness, well, it happens by chance. The Latin hap means chance or luck. Right? Happiness happens by chance, but joy, listen, happens by choice. It's, it's, it's choices that we make in the relationship that we have with God. Happiness is based on circumstance. Joy is based on Jesus. That's what we talked about last week. And so I want to carry forward today as we move into chapter 2 of Philippians. Um, what I've kind of decided is almost like the theme verse is actually Philippians 4.4. 4, and it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. When? Always, always. Had a bad week? Hallelujah. Had a great week? Hallelujah. That's, that's what that verse, and then it says, I'll say it again in case y'all weren't paying attention. Hello. Rejoice. 
I want you to rejoice and then I want you to rejoice. Right? Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Why? Well, because the news stinks. Right? I don't know. What do you watch? Fox, CNN, some other craziness and with their tainted bias ideas? Come on. And, 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 and what I hear is gas prices and the economy and recession and Biden this and blah, blah, that and Russia and Ukraine, blah, 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 blah. We get to a point where I, I, what happened to the good old days? Wow, oh, man, it's just so terrible and I'm so worried. Listen, listen, listen. I really wonder if they're not pushing to legalize marijuana because it's just, well, maybe we can have a little relief we get stoned. Right? I mean, because we're chasing happiness. What Paul's talking to us over and over in Philippians is about this thing called joy. So I was thinking about happiness and I was thinking about me. What makes me? What makes Mike happy? I was like, well, my wife. My wife makes me happy. I mean, I really like her. We, we, we're good friends. But she, she don't make me happy all the time. <laughs> right? I guarantee you I don't make her happy all the time. If you had to live with me, you have no idea. You would pray a lot more for Jennifer Matheny. <laughs> my, my kids make me happy. But not all the time. I mean, come on, there are days when you understand why tigers eat their young. We've all been there. Church of the Lakes makes me happy. Until I get one of those text messages, I need to talk to you. Oh, yeah. what, what is this? What, what is this one going to be about? And I start doing the crazy thing where we create narratives in our head, right? Reacting to and panic. And, and they just call and say, oh, I just want to tell you something. It was great. You're like, oh, Jesus, thank you. Right? Cheese grits make me happy. Anybody like some cheese grits? Come on, somebody. If you don't like cheese grits, you need to get saved. I'm just saying. <laughs> they make me happy. The one food, when I, we, we, we went to Africa and lived in Africa for seven months, and we ate couscous and vegetables every day. I hate vegetables. I hated couscous for a lot of months after that. But when they asked, what's the first thing you're going to eat when you came home? And everybody's like, a big juicy steak, hamburger, this, no, no, cheese grits. I wanted cheese grits and some blackened fish off of my off of my my father-in-law's uh, black pan. Come on, somebody! I, I mean, Reese's peanut butter cups make me happy. Until I eat too many of them. Come on, somebody! An empty email inbox makes me happy. But when was the last time you saw one of those? Don't lie. I hate email. Listen, can I can I warn you now? If you send me an email, I'm gonna find it next month. I'm just warning you now. Text me, call Lizzie, and it'll get done faster, I promise. The Seminoles make me happy. I didn't ask you what made you happy. I'm talking, I got the microphone. I don't care what, no, I'm just kidding. Until recent years, and we don't know how to win a football game, right? Like, I mean, I start my list, goes on and on. Crawfish make me happy. Girl Scout Thin Mint Blizzards make me happy. Uh, the blind auditions on The Voice make me happy. Anybody else? I know that's weird, but I love it when some kids up, gets up there, kills it, gets a four-turn chair. I'm just in my living room going, yeah, go, kid. I know I'm weird. I don't care. It makes me happy. Pickleball makes me happy. Musical theater, blah, 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 blah. You know what's consistent about all these things? They all fail. They all fail. They all leave me chasing something else to make up for what they lack today. Right? So I started thinking about happiness. What is what happiness? So I was doing a little research, and I came up with this research about the happiest states in the United States. Let me show you some, some facts here. Look at this. Uh, lowest share of adult depression. There's, there's the ones that have the lowest adult depression. Here's the ones with the highest adult depression. West Virginia, Oregon, Tennessee, these, right? Uh, adequate sleep rates. Keep going, Lizzie. There's, there's a bunch of these. Highest sports participation, lowest sports. I mean, these are all external things that this article is using. I think it was Newsweek. That, that they're trying to figure out happiness. What makes people happy, right? Uh, long-term unemployment. Look at this one. Law, lowest long-term unemployment rate. Look at this. Highest long-term unemployment rate. Look at number 47. That's us, right? That's Florida. Keep going. Highest income growth. Okay. Those all look good now. Highest volunteer rate. This one killed me. 
lowest volunteer rate. Who's last on the list? Florida. Us. Interesting. Keep going. Lowest divorce rate. Look at Florida. Second highest divorce rate in the United States. All right. What's the safest? <laughs> Look at, come on, y'all. I was born in Mississippi. The other half of my family is from Louisiana. I now live in Florida. <laughs> Anybody seen a pattern under least safest? If you can't read that, Florida's number 48. Louisiana's number 49. And Mississippi killing it at number 50. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at all these happy things, right? And so there's a whole list of all of the states. So, so put up that list. This is 1 to 50 of the happiest states in the United States according to what they judged. But let me tell you, all that they judged were external things, right? They were external things in nature. And I looked at this. Last year, North Dakota was the happiest state in the United States. North Dakota, like, does anybody even know where that is? North Dakota. Right, y'all knew? Y'all are, okay. Yeah, right, yeah. Up there by Iowa. No, I'm just kidding. But, but, but when you read it, it was because there's open space and income growth opportunity, blah, blah, blah. I'm reading all this. But listen to me, my whole point is this is, it's all external. It's all external. And all of these things go away. So Paul wants to talk to us about getting to a place in our life where we're beyond chasing happiness. Really, most of us will hear of a drug overdose or we'll hear of somebody who's an addict and we go, oh, that's a shame. But if we're really honest, we're no different in so many different ways. Because we're the drug addict chasing the happiness, right? Chasing the Friday night, Chasing the perfect vacation, chasing these things only to find that it's empty in the end and I've got to do it all over again. So Paul is trying to get us to focus on joy. Let's jump into Philippians 2.1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. So he's carrying forward this idea of joy. And he says, you'd make my joy complete by you really finding joy, not chasing happiness. And he jumps in to this next verse. And I believe in this verse, he gives us two joy killers. Two joy killers that I see that are prominent in our culture today. And every single one of us are wrestling with these. To some level or another. Look at this, Philippians 2 and 3. Do nothing out of, here they are, selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Selfish ambition and vain conceit. I think Paul gives us two very specific joy killers. That's countercultural. It's counter to our thinking because we're chasing this happiness. And he says that happiness that you're chasing is actually what's killing your joy. It's it, like I said, it, it, it's, it's upside down in its thinking. And so it's selfish ambition. And let me say it to you this way. I think the joy killer is living to impress, living to impress, living in such a way where I'm worried about what everybody thinks of. Right? Living our lives because, well, I'm going to get mine and I'm going to be cool and all. And can, and can I say this to you? If we're honest, I'll pick on something I said earlier. Guys, when I say ballroom dancing, quite often we're like, um, I don't think, because I don't want to be uncomfortable and I don't want to look bad. Right? I mean, that's, that's where our minds go because we're, we're selfish. Is anybody else admit you're selfish? Is there anybody else that would say, yeah? I'm, I'm selfish. Like, our sinful nature wants what our sinful nature wants when we want it. So we live to impress. So we have these things called social media filters. Because I don't want to actually look like me. I want to look better. <laughs> think, that, think through the psychology of what that is and what we're doing that. So I'm living to promote myself or maybe to get more stuff. And then the other one is vain conceit. And that's living for attention. I'm living to get attention. 
like me, like me, like me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. The obsessive need for approval. For somebody to say, you're awesome and you're wonderful and you're great. Someone to like our social media posts. But can I tell you what the enemy is doing? The American Psychiatric Association has come up with a new term called selfieitis. You can look it up, okay? I'm not making this up. You look it up. Selfieitis. And, and, the, and, and what it is, is it's an obsessive compulsive desire to take pictures of oneself and post them on social media, on Facebook or whatever, to make up for a lack of self-esteem and to fill an intimacy gap. They go so far as to say, and I try to figure out where the line is. Like it's if, if you have 10 selfies, is that it? Does that make selfieitis? If you have 20, is that selfie? I like it. But I couldn't find anything to give us a level. But what they do say is this. They say selfieitis, the American Psychiatric Association has officially confirmed it as a mental disorder. And the research is coming out now. We've been doing these things for long enough for us to catch the idea. So the idea of me posting these things to, to press, right? It goes on. How does selfieitis affect mental health? Loneliness. An unconscious cry for help. Obsessed with self and oblivious to other people's opinions or speech. Highly attention-seeking, difficult relations with family and friends. Addictive tendencies, lack in confidence, and feeling the need to fit in and gain approval. Posting selfies to one's social media has adverse cause effects on the self-image and mood of young women. And could make them more vulnerable to clinical eating, mood, and anxiety disorders. I realize I'm pushing in a little bit today. I realize I'm, I'm stirring some thought, and I hope I am, and I hope you feel some concern or some conviction enough to say, do I need to address this? Do I need to consider this? Because maybe what I'm chasing, getting little moments of happiness because I got 100 people like this picture, is actually what's killing my joy. It's actually what's got me off because it's actually vain conceit in the process. Can I ask you this question as your pastor? Can I advise you with something? Please stop posting your emotions on social media. I feel depressed today. I've, what, what is it? Listen to me. Whatever somebody's going to say to you or liken you is not going to fix your depression. You're going to fix that depression eyeball to eyeball. You're going to fix, fix that because you're... You're in relationship with somebody. You need people around you. There's not a person in here this morning that doesn't deal with depression. That doesn't deal with insecurity. I mean, there's a narcissist here and there every once in a while. But the reality is, is most of us, we, 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 we don't feel so great about ourselves. We look in the mirror and all this. We're all in this together. The problem with attention like that is it's addictive. Right? That type of attention, it's addictive. Once I get a little bit of taste, I need a little bit more. Once I get a little bit of taste, I need a little bit more. And it puts us in a place where now we're actually headlong running towards happiness, running the complete opposite direction from what Paul is talking about, to what joy. What it means for God to put something in us and transform our hearts and transform our minds into an understanding of how he's created us. Fearfully and wonderfully. Right? There was a universal study by California University. What are the most common trends currently in our culture? This is what they came up with. Preoccupation with self. Being above the rules. Inability to take criticism. Re refusal to take responsibility. And this one, unilateral listening. You know what that is? It means that you're listening only to respond. You're listening and taking their words in, and you're only figuring out how you can turn those words and say what you want to say back. And ultimately, listen, we are quicker to anger than ever before. The American Psychiatric Association has said this is the most narcissistic version of our culture that has been seen in current history. And it's not because we really are narcissist, I think, in the idea of self, look at me, I'm so cool and I'm big and bad. It's, we've learned this new culture of, that's how I get noticed. Right, that, that's what it means to get attention in a healthy way, and this is what's going to bring me happy. And we end up there, listen, it's actually natural for us to end up there. Like, that's natural. What do I mean by that is, well, you have a sin nature. Your sin nature 
just saying me, 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 right? Your, your sin nature is all about I want what I want, when I want it, the way I want it, how I want it, right now, and get out of my way. So it's natural for us to go there. But can I say this to you this morning that it's so important? Listen to me. God created you to live a supernatural life. He created you in such a way that he wants to put his Holy Spirit inside of you through the blood of Jesus on the cross, that you might be transformed into understanding who you are and that this silly body is going away. Come on, somebody. Praise Jesus. The silly body is going away. Anybody else? Yes. That there's something bigger than 80 years. That there's something bigger than a 401k or a retirement account. There's something bigger than come on, pickleball, golf, whatever you want to say. Listen to me. There's something super natural, but it's not found in chasing happiness. It's found in finding our joy in who God has created us to be. So Paul goes on, Philippians 2 and 5, your attitude, oh, here we go. Okay, let's start with attitude. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, he was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he didn't feel entitled. Oh, I wasn't gonna tell the story. Okay, here I go. Confession is good for the heart and terrible for the reputation. Are you ready? July 4th, we went out on a boat, took some couples out on the boat. We're part of a boat club. The boat club, you're supposed to be back before dark. Right, but the fireworks are showing, so we wanted to watch the fireworks. So we go to leave and the deckhand says to me, says, um, I said something about watching the fireworks. He said, well, you know, you gotta be back here. Y'all can watch them from here, but you gotta be back at the dock. Selfish, natural Mike thought, I know the owners, we're good friends, whatever. And so I looked at him and went, yeah, yeah, okay. And I did. So we stayed out and watched the fireworks. We came back in and the decade came over and he goes, really Mike, I feel like you just ignored what I said. And I tried to laugh it off, and I'm like, man, I'm sorry, you know, and he went, no. And he walked off, man. And I texted the owner, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get that kid in trouble. And I knew the owner, and they did say to me, it's okay, we knew you would stay out. Like, but isn't that the dangerous, listen to me, isn't that the dangerous moment when I, I knew it was okay? The problem was not okay, the problem was Mike's heart. The problem was entitlement, right? very next morning, I listened to a podcast by Andy Stanley, and he was talking about moral failures, and he was specifically talking about pastors and leaders and moral failures, and he said, you know what the problem is, is we hear these big stories of moral failures. We don't hear all the little stories that led up to the big story, and he used the word entitlement, and the Holy Spirit pierced my heart, and he said, I'm just letting you know, if you're going to live that way, you're going to be the next moral failure because you're going to take entitlement after entitlement after entitlement until you get to the point where you think you're above the rules. So there's my confession. Let me ask you, can you get really serious about the idea of what it means to humble myself? What it means to understand that, so can I tell y'all I've been driving a little slower? Because I'm looking at every rule and going, where do I have an entitlement mentality? Where do I have an attitude that's not like Jesus? What held Jesus on the cross? I told you last week, it wasn't nails. It was joy. It was the joy of what would happen in you when you found real joy. That's what held him on the cross, right? It says, but he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank God for Jesus, right? Thank God for the example. Jesus is so great because he stooped so low. Because he walked as a servant. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. By the way, I went back and confessed my sin, just so you know. Because you know what the key to joy is? To develop a servant's heart. Develop a servant's heart. Not to get to the point where you expect to be served. 
Not to get to the point where because you've raised to this certain level in the business, you're entitled to skip this, to fudge that, to change this number. Maybe because you have a new title or because you have a new opportunity, because you've given this, because you're the captain of the team at school. But no, Jesus says you become the number one servant in this whole process. Hebrews 12 and 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. There it is. It's joy that held him on the cross, not nails. Scorning its shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is on the cross and he's, he's not saying I have to do this because they're so terrible. It was joy to serve. Knowing the joy it could bring to you. Developing a servant's heart. So how do we do this? And this is, this is so countercultural, right? And so he gives us some practical ways in the rest of the chapter. Let's look at these as we, as we close out today. How do you develop a certain servant's heart? Number one, you're going to have to go all in with God. You're going to have to go all in with God. It's got to be an all or nothing. It's not a, to anybody, you know that person that stands next to the cold pool and puts their toe in? And everybody just says to them what? Just jump, right? It's the exact same. Listen, that person will sit there all day long and talk themselves out of it, right? But listen to me, you've got to go all in and understand that God is our source. Philippians 2 and 12. Therefore, dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue, look at the words, to work out your salvation. You know what I did the other day on July 4th? I was working out my salvation. I was working out dealing with sinful thoughts and processes in my mind, in my head. Because you know what? Holy doesn't mean perfect. Holy means forgiven, set apart. Right? And so to go back and say, wow, I learned from this God. And thank you, God, for giving me this lesson so I don't have a bigger lesson down the road. Right? And understanding that every day we have this opportunity to be a people that set a standard that is way above what is around us. But we, uh, we seem to have this mentality, well, everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to get mine. And everybody else is cheating here, so I'm going to do and, and And our Father is looking to and fro for a people and saying, no, 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 I'll, I'll acknowledge my sinful nature. I'll, I'll acknowledge that I'm selfish and I'll humble myself. Mm. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. So you don't just say a prayer and you're good. Right? Well, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to heaven. When I, when I was nine, I, I walked the aisle and prayed the prayer. It says, work out your salvation. It doesn't say, well, you're good. You got your get out of hell free ticket. Work out your salvation. There's, there's no relationship in that. But there's relationship in working out that you live with him as your source. In a relationship that becomes the source of my joy, regardless of my circumstances. When I'm self-focused, I get worn out. Come on, y'all. I am high maintenance. Anybody else? If I'm trying to make Mike happy, I'm exhausted by the end of the day, right? Trying, trying to get my heart satisfied with all these silly things and, and, and chase. I mean, I am high maintenance because desire never gets satisfied with things of this world. Joy, contentment, not needing to impress and get attention is found in mature, developed relationship with Jesus. And I understand what he says about me and who. Fairly, fairly frequently, I'll get somebody that comes and they'll say, they'll give me their resume. They'll give, they'll give me their credentials. Right? And Pastor, I want you to know, I, I'm a teacher. I do this and I've done this and I lead worship. I'm better than Israel Houghton, blah, 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 whatever. And, and, and usually they're seeking. Why? They're seeking attention. They're seeking a title. They're seeking to move up. I heard of a pastor one time that Young man comes to him, he's like, Pastor, I just got a seminary. Man, I, I, 
I'm, I'm burning up ready. I'm ready to get it, man. I want to preach the word. Pastor, this is fantastic. I need you to do me a favor. Uh, the, the fence out in front of the church needs to be painted. So here's a paintbrush and here's some paint. And of course, you know, the kid's like, wait, I don't, you heard me. I'm a preacher. I'm ready. And he goes, God, I'm going to need you to paint. And what it really comes down to is for God to put you where he needs to put you, for God to put you in the position he has for you, it requires a humble heart. Proverbs 18 and 16 says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the grave. Not his ability to manipulate or negotiate. But the reality of when we come to a place of understanding, my source is Jesus. And if I will push into relationship and understand who he's created me to be and stop chasing the happiness that the world has for me, joy, contentment, purpose, meaning, he goes on. Number two. If we're, going to, if we're going to develop this servant's heart, we're going to have to take a genuine interest in others. A genuine interest in others. The current culture is tired of empty words. The, current, the young people today, they're so tired of words. They're so tired of unrealistic blah, 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 but nobody shows up. Right? Rhetoric that is never backed up by actions. Philippians 2 and 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send you Timothy. So Paul's got this guy Timothy with him, and he's trained him up. And to send to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Listen to this. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. You got this picture, like, what has Timothy been doing? He, he, he must talk about Philippi and the church in Philippi. He must constantly be praying for them. He must be aggravating Paul. Have you gotten a letter? Have you got a letter? Have you heard anything? What's going on in Philippi? A genuine concern, a genuine heart for other people. A genuine interest is different than a social media interest. Well, I'm interested in people because I know what's going on in their life. Well, that's only because you stalk them on Facebook. Right? No, 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 no. A genuine interest. It's being involved with somebody's life. The, the actual definition of genuine is having the, having the values claimed. Having the values claimed. In other words, a bunch of words, but do I see it backed up? So genuine interest is that we care for people with our actions like we claim with our words. We care for people with our actions. We've got to be a church at some point. Listen, we need funds and we need to put things at you, but at some point we've got to get our hands dirty. At some point, we've got to take a genuine, because what happens is if I schedule my day around my, man, am I chasing happiness. But if I schedule my day with genuine interest in others, it's different. What are you talking about, Pastor Mike? Well, coming in November, we're going to do a series called The Power of One. The power you have, the sphere of influence that you have, and how do you affect that? What is that sphere of influence? Well, one is my people. There are people right around you, right? Let's start within our home. Do I have a genuine interest? A a a am I really sitting down, not just going through the motions, but taking an understanding of what is going on inside of them? What else is your sphere of influence? Your place, the places God has put you, your workplace, your neighborhood, this church, other places that God, your, your space, do I have a genuine, genuine interest? Or are those just things on my schedule? So when Jesus showed up, he, he, he looked at the least likely in the room. He, he, he looked for the hurting. It seemed like he constantly was looking for the least likely in the Bible that none of us would pick. Not the tall, good-looking, perfect, credential person. But he was got a genuine interest. And then your passions, how do you serve? Fill a need and find it. Number three, if we're going to develop the servant's heart, we've got to live a life of intentional relationships. Live a life of intentional relationships, Philippians 2 and 25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. What a name, right? Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs, right? We go all in to set the stage for a servant's heart. We go all in to set the stage for a servant's heart, all in in our relationship with him. We develop a servant's heart, by taking a genuine interest in other people. 
And we protect our servant's heart with intentional relationships. People around me that help me stay focused. People around me that will call me out on my selfishness. People around me that will say, you know, that, I don't think that was such a good idea. Or I don't think this is such a good idea. But guess what? You're going to have to develop those relationships. That's why we do small groups. That's why come September, man, from now until September, you're going to hear me small groups, small groups, small groups, small groups. Because you need someone around you that you can take the mask off. You need someone around you that when you say something, they go, yeah, nice try. Now tell me the truth. We've got, to, if we're going to have to develop, why? Because it's natural for us to be selfish in our sinful nature. We're going to have to have some people to help us live supernaturally, right? People around us, right? We, we have a dream team, which is what we call our volunteers. And yes, we need to get things done. We've got jobs and projects and those kind of things. But it is about the conversation and the relationships that are built in the process that are really important. We, we need you to get on a team, not to get a job done, but because we need you to get to a place where you have intentional relationships so people protect your servant's heart. It is healthy for us to gather as the body of Christ, but we need to protect each other's hearts. Now, here's the promise that comes with all of this. Philippians 2 and 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good? To become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Boy, you can almost feel like he's writing this verse for this time period, right? In a crooked and depraved generation. Listen to this. In which you shine like stars in the universe. And if we will stop just chasing happiness. If we'll get really serious about our sinful nature and we'll say, I I want to live a supernatural life. And that only comes by going all in in a relationship with Jesus. By beginning to take a genuine interest in other people. How many of y'all know people are really messed up? And if you don't realize how messed up people around you are, you are the really messed up person. Come on, we're a mess. You know why we don't do this, I think? It's because to invest in somebody is like renovating an old home. What I mean by that is you go in and you rip the drywall down and you find 14 other projects that have to be fixed. Yes? Same is true with people. Come on. The moment you step into a relationship with somebody, you, you, you tear down the drywall. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I knew you were jacked up, but I didn't know you were like just shy of being a serial killer, right? Come on. That, let's be very real about people. And that's... That's why most of us push back. That's why we go back to the natural, our sinful nature. Oh, whoa, 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 I don't, I don't want to get all the way into that. I don't want to get all messy. Can I say thank God for a group of men that are in our love and action? We, we got a young couple bought this house, and that's all they could do. Y'all know the housing market's ridiculous crazy right now. It's all they could afford, and it's a fixer-upper. That, that was the words I was told until I went and looked at it. It's not a fixer-upper. It's a holy moly. So we had 70 year old men, listen to me, dumpster diving at construction projects in this church. Dumpster diving over at Lake Denham, where they're building all the houses. The other day in their dumpster diving, they found enough studs to rebuild a whole wall in this old house. When I went over there the other day, holy moly, like it looks like a bomb went off. They're like tearing out wall, fixing holes in the floors and all this sort of stuff. Pastor Doug and I went over there together and I looked at Pastor Doug and I said, you know what, this, this is it. This, this is a physical picture of why most of us don't get involved with other people's lives. Because what looks like it's going to be one little thing turns into 17 other it costs. It costs. In church, it's our calling. It's our calling to get into the middle of the mess of everybody else's life. And it's painful. And it's messy. And it's frustrating. Come on, you give them advice and they do the exact opposite. 
It's exactly what Jesus did for you and me. He stepped into the mess of a person. He said, I'll wait in. And when he waded in with Mike, man, it was over his head almost. You know what I mean? That's what it looks like. That's, that's what it means to be. We, we can't call ourselves Christians. The, the actual term Christian means little Christ. I kind of take it this way. It means you're a little bit like Jesus. And you're trying to get a little bit more like Jesus. And to do that is, a, is to take on a servant's heart. Is, is to say, okay, God, I'm going all in with you. I'm going to stop chasing the happiness of this world. I'm going to stop chasing these empty things. And I'm going to find my joy in taking genuine interest in the mess of this world. It's a mess. I get a bird's eye, not even a bird's eye. I get a very localized view every week when I do ride-alongs. You know, I told you guys, I've stood over like five dead bodies in the last couple weeks. Overdoses and it's broken situations and broken lives. And it's so easy for us to throw some money at it and walk away. It's different for us to take a genuine interest. And I'm just telling you now, there's no dollar figure, there's no bank account, there's no boat, there's no vacation. There is nothing that will give you the high, the joy that comes of being part of the transformation of somebody's heart, life, and ultimately eternity. Amen? That's the call. It's the call that Paul is giving to us. First Peter 5 and 6, I'll close. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And here's the last filling on your notes. We humble ourselves, God exalts us. Humble ourselves, God exalts us. We humble ourselves, and God exalts us. So, what are you chasing? If you're honest, are you living to impress? You like to post those pictures that make everybody else jealous on social media? You like to post the stuff to get some likes and, and all this? Can I, can I ask you to really ask the Holy Spirit, challenge yourself, why am I posting this? Why am I saying this? Why am I doing this particular action? And if it's because you're chasing happiness, can I encourage you to run the opposite direction? Run to Jesus, who is consistent and faithful and the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen? Let's ask God to help us do that. Let's pray. Father, challenge us a bit today because, boy, this touches all of us in our sinful nature, in our desire for what we want and how we want it, when we want it. God, I confess my sin here in front of the whole church. An entitlement mentality. The Holy Spirit, would you help us to be honest with ourselves? Living to impress, my living for attention. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? And then God, help me push in and go all in with you. Help me understand when I take a genuine interest in other people, that's where real joy is going to come. So who, God, have you put in my sphere of influence as I head into another week? Who can I serve this week? Who can I give extra attention to this week? Who can I call or text or encourage? Who can I build up their life instead of trying to post how great mine is? Give us the attitude of Jesus, the humble servant. And with your eyes closed, if you've never heard Jesus talked about like this, it may be today that you realize, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I know about him, but I don't really have a relationship. And what's amazing is every day his arms are wide open saying, I want a relationship with you, no matter who you are, where you are, what you've done. And so if that relationship begins, it's not the end, but it begins with maybe something like this, Jesus, today, confess my sins to you. I, I thank you that you forgave them through the cross. Today I surrender my life. I want to be in a relationship with you, Jesus. I, I want to know what you have for me. I want to know my purpose and, 
and the destiny, the plan, and the meaning that I have in my life. So today, as best as I understand, I begin a relationship with you by surrendering my heart to you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Church, I don't know if y'all sensed it, but today was special. I mean, it started in worship. The Holy Spirit was just very, very present in this place today. So these words that he wants to speak to us today, just just really, the Bible has a word, Selah. Selah means pause, think that through. So the Bible will say, blah, 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 Selah. It means, hey, whoa, 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 stop and meditate on that. Can I encourage you today to maybe take some time at Sabbath? Don't, don't run so quick to whatever. Or take some time after a nap this afternoon or something. What was God saying today? What was he put his finger on? And let's not be heroes of the word, but doers this week. What, what little thing can I change? What thing can I alter in my thinking? Does that make sense to everybody? We could do a little bit differently today. And I want to invite you before we close. Today's life step two of our life steps. I really push for new folks to come to life step two. In just a moment when we close, you go out the door to the left, down the hallway, there's a door that says the rock. I'll meet you in there. We'll spend about 45 minutes together, but today especially is the day we talk about what does Church of the Lakes look like? Who am I accountable to? How are we structured? How do we do finances? That kind of stuff. So it's a great day if you're kicking the tires to come find out more about the church. So if that's you, come join us for a few minutes. I promise not to keep you too long, but come and hear that today. Life Step 2, jump in. If you haven't done Life Steps, you need to jump in. It's the way you're going to take a genuine interest in other people and develop the relationships, I promise. Okay? All right, let's stand to our feet. Don't run off. I know you filled in the last blank, but don't run off. Don't, don't just walk away from what God is saying this morning. Maybe take a moment as the team leads us in worship before you take off today. Love you guys. See you next week.